Hello and welcome back to Historians 2, Netflix vs. History. Today, three essential things to understand Germanic history, part two. Now, if you haven't seen part one, don't worry, that is not necessary to follow me through today's video. Although, I do advise you, as your personal historical advisor, to watch both part one and two before we get to part three next time. Now during the intro you'll have a couple of seconds to click both like and subscribe and if you feel like supporting us even more you can now become a channel member of Kaptoga Visual History here on YouTube. Thank you very much in advance. And now it's intro time. <laughs> Names and identities. Most of you at some point have probably seen a map like this in their life where you can see all the different Germanic tribes and where they used to live. Now these maps are naturally also based on the Roman reports about the Germanic regions that we have and this fact alone advises us to treat them with a bit of caution. But looking at them alone can already tell us quite a bit though. In the regions closest to the Rhine the empire's border, we can see many tiny spots with many different tribes names written on them, whereas the further we go east, the larger those areas become that are related to a certain group or tribe bearing a certain name. Now that suggests that towards the east, single tribes formed larger communities and inhabited bigger chunks of land, which was most probably not the case though. It's far more realistic that in the regions Rome was in contact with the most, the ones closest to their border, their distinction would have been more detailed, whereas in the regions further away, their state of information about the tribes there and their territory would have been more based on hearsay reports and single encounters. Accordingly, we cannot assume any other information about these regions to be overly reliable. So much for the obvious. The next problem are the names themselves. We do not know where they come from. That begins with every single one of those tribes names and goes up to the big term Germani. Germanics. Now, what does that matter, you might ask now? Well, if we don't know where those names are coming from, we can't tell what they actually mean to describe. Yes, a Germanic tribe, but by whose definition? Who went there and drew the borders and said, these are the Chati, those are the Brukteri, and those guys over there are the Hruski. And different source texts often call the same people in the same region differently. So as far as we know, those names might be Romanized versions of the tribe's self-given names, but they might just as well be Romanized versions of the names that the Gallic population gave to their neighbors. They might also be completely made up or they might be generalized attributions based on one single group that was encountered in a certain area. In the end it will most probably be a mixture of all of the former possibilities. The term Germanii is first mentioned in a text fragment about one barbarian group living somewhere in the north and was then made famous by Caesar when he was looking for an umbrella term for all the different people living across the Rhine. We'll get to the whys in another video but even later Roman writers like Tacitus were already very well aware of the fact that Germanii as an all Germanic umbrella term is a Roman invention. So again, the whole picture gets somewhat blurred and shaky and heavily shaped by the perspectives of single writers out of a Roman context. Most historians nowadays are going as far as to say that Caesar himself invented the Germanics as an ethnic concept. So why do we still use those terms then? Admittedly, there are voices within the scientific discussion demanding that the term Germanic shouldn't be used anymore because it does not accurately describe anything but the Roman perspective exclusively. But well, we're sort of lacking the alternatives. That's all we have. And archaeologists nowadays also prefer to distinguish Germanic cultures by region and by the significant cultural characteristics that are being observed in those different regions instead of using the tribes names we get from the Roman sources. Because they're just 
too wishy-washy for a scientific discourse. So at second glance also these maps tend to be rather inaccurate and we don't know if the people living in those differently colored regions actually identified with the categorizations that are being made here from the outside. But what we do know is that those different tribes did not constitute coherent political unities. That's the third big problem about maps like these, the suggestion they make to the modern eye. Nearly all of us nowadays are used to established national states and borders that at least in some way seem to represent certain historical ethnic divisions. But that in itself is already the outcome of drawn borders that derive from the outlines of former monarchic states that never actually complied with any ethnic division lines. Those were usually rather blurry and those monarchs and noble families in power usually didn't really care much about the ethnic identification of their subjects as long as they did their job as such and paid taxes. Today many of those borders date back quite a while and the common development within them created a certain uniformity of ethnical identification which has definitely not always been there. Now with these modern glasses on we are heavily tempted to misread those maps and understand those different spots as socio-political unities with fixed borders. That is how barbarians comes to misunderstand Arminius and before him his father Segemir as the leader of the Heruskins. Cheruski. I will be your new Reich now. By the way, the word Reich they use in the show is completely made up and the only contemporary term we have for those Germanic leaders would be the Latin word princeps. And within each one of those postulated tribes there's a whole number of those principes who all act rather independently, so there's hardly any political unity at all. Even within the borders of one tribe, Different chiefs usually pursued different goals and ambitions rather than joining a common cause. While some of them decided to sign a peace treaty with Rome, others decided not to. So whatever the Roman texts describe as tribes like Hatti, Heruski, Brukteri cannot be considered coherent entities that are in any way politically unified or centrally governed. And Arminius was never the leader or princeps of the Heruski if we're using that term, he was one among several, although for some time apparently the most powerful and influential one among them. What will you do? Complain to his cavalry? But still each and every one of the other principes held their own authority over their own little tribal community. Segestus, whom we can see in the show as well, would have been one of them and also a rather powerful one. That is what makes the whole depiction of Segestus in Barbarians absolutely nonsensical, starting in season 1 where he seems to be the right hand of Segemir Reich of the Cheruski. and continuing in season 2 where Arminius has Segestus banished from the tribe, which is firstly historical bullshit because Segestus had his own estate where he himself would have been the sovereign leader with his own subjects and his own contingent of warriors and, by the way, a strong connection to the Roman administration and military. Parus considers me his friend, you all know that. So, good luck banishing that guy from his own Arminius and see if he cares. Secondly, it is again ideologically so problematic because it again raises the narrative of the ones who stay true to their Germanic nature, land and heritage, the true Germanics on one side and the traitors on the other, which is again exactly how nationalist propaganda tried to tell the story of Segestus. And they were sustainably successful as it seems. Partes meas egi. Proditione mamo. Sed proditionem non laud. <laughs> A traitor to the Germanii, a concept that in itself, as I told you earlier, is a Roman construct that had nothing to do with real Germanic identities, which were rather regional and small-scaled and based around the communities that they lived in. 
Also, identities are quite a flexible thing and always adapt to the surrounding circumstances. We have many legal reports, for example, about this woman living in a Langobardi community in northern Italy, who in one context refers to herself as Langobardic and in some other context refers to herself as Roman, since she's a full-fledged citizen of the empire and she's a well-integrated individual within its society. A very loose common Germanic identity would then eventually, although in a very slow process over centuries, develop much later in the Germanic regions and only because of the influence Rome's perspective had on these regions. Let me give you another example here. Have any of you watched The Walking Dead? Yes? The Walking Dead. There you have these post-apocalyptic societies fighting for survival in a very hostile environment. Now all of these people were once considered part of the society of the United States of America. But as soon as the system and its administration are breaking down, people join together in smaller, manageable groups who either fight each other or live in collaboration with each other. Their communal identity does no longer lie with the city, the state or the country they grew up in, but rather with the community they decided to or in some other way came to be with. Now imagine a landscape of many, many small tribal communities who never even had such a concept as a national state. Because from today, We'll be like one great nation against them. Or a common administration that held them together as a society, either based on ethnical or any other kind of common identification, and you're getting somewhat close to what the rather eclectic landscape of Germanic identities would have looked like. I don't care if you're a Roman or a feeble Cheruscan. The tribes united. <laughs> the drunk Alderic from the Marcy. And these whoremongers from the chatty. <laughs> and you as our leader. I don't trust any of you lousy pig fuckers. The idea, the trope that all Germanic tribes shared a common identity is the direct outcome of an umbrella term like Germani being given from the outside <laughs> Pairing with modern projections by an early modern society that is getting used to the idea of established national states and is heavily trying to promote that idea, but it does not comply with the historic reality of the Germanics at all. And only when we understand that, that Germanic groups were usually not organized in a larger context, we'll get to the few exceptions or identified as part of a large ethnic group, as in we are Germanic. And that every single one of those groups was following their own individual needs and ambitions, we can even start approaching the topic, because otherwise we're doomed to misunderstand what's happening there. And this fact is, as well, key to understanding why the Roman army might have conquered the place over and over again, but never managed to hold it for very long, let alone establish a Roman province there, as they were trying to so very, very hard for almost three decades. But that is going to be our topic for the final part of three essential things to understand Germanic history. The part where we are actually going to talk more about Germanics than about Romans. But understanding the Roman perspective is unavoidable if we want to understand what they're trying to tell us about their barbarian neighbors in the north. And I very much hope that is something I could achieve during the last two videos. Let me know what you're thinking in the comments and don't forget to give me the appreciation of liking and subscribing to our channel. Also, feel free to share our content wherever you can, so less people have to rely on Netflix to educate themselves about Germanic history. If you feel like supporting us even more, we'll gladly welcome you into our YouTube community via channel membership, or join us on Patreon where we offer a lot more content about history in Germany. See you soon for three essential things to understand Germanic history, part three, until then, have a good one and bye for now. Uh, <clears throat> this is actually the worst thing I could do right now, but I feel like treating myself.
Lollipop, 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 lollipop